Hello, um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, we are now uh, about to have a fantastic session and Ask Me Anything on AI powered search. Uh, my name is Charlie Hull from Open Source Connections, and I'm also one of the organizers of the Haystack Conference. Um, we're going to, uh, firstly, I'm going to introduce uh, our two speakers tonight. Um, we have, firstly, uh, Doug Turnbull who is the CTO of Open Source Connections. You may know him from uh, being the author of Relevant Search, which is a wonderful book. I even have it on my desk here. Um, and uh, Doug uh, pushes the boundary on what's possible with uh, search and relevance um, and works with many clients to really uh, figure out how to help them best to, to achieve fantastic search. And I know Doug's been looking into the future of search and is contributing to a new book that's coming out soon uh, from Manning called AI Powered Search. And we also have uh, Trey Granger. Uh, Trey is uh, used to be uh, up until, I think literally last week, the Chief Algorithms Officer at LucidWorks. Uh, Trey has a long and distinguished history in search and relevance. And uh, Trey is leading the charge on the AI Powered Search book I mentioned earlier. And uh, Trey, uh, Trey, just before we get into this, you've got some news on your, your new direction, don't you? Yeah. Hey, Charlie. Um, you, as you mentioned, I've uh, been at uh, Lucid Works for a little over four years um, and actually just left to start a new company uh, called uh, Search Kernel uh, that is a uh, search um, relevance, AI-powered search sort of uh, consultancy and software development company. Um, got some exciting news coming up in the coming weeks or, uh, about that as well. But uh, but yeah, it's a uh, can be a fun uh, new adventure for me so looking forward to it okay so um yeah i i just wanted to um uh, i've i i'm afraid i'm having some trouble accessing the slack at the moment so um doug do you do you want to give me a, a quick introduction perhaps uh, as to um wh where where you think the next um, the next big thing is with search. Well, I mean, uh, is it is it vectors? Uh, what, what's the next thing? Oh yeah, uh, we had a lengthy conversation about this at Open Source Connections retreat um, about where we think the future is going, and I think it's an interesting conversation. And I think you could talk about it in a couple of different ways. One is the evolution of search itself and ranking. So um, machine learning coming more to the front as opposed to being this uh, sort of thing off in the distance that is often aspirational for a lot of teams. Um, and along with that, I think comes a lot of sort of vector-based approaches to search, dense vector specifically. We've always, search engines have always been sparse vector-based uh, indexes. And um, how the two systems interplay in a single system, I think is an interesting question and one that we're solving. Um, I think to uh, another sort of direction is the extent to which the search UI is changing um, and how people want to interact with search results. So in, I think a lot of, you, you see this with Google and I blogged about this recently, um, if you search for something like the never ending story on Google, you'll get a search results page with all kinds of different question boxes. Uh, some of them are answering specific questions. Some of them are asking you if you wanna watch the movie never ending story. Some of them are giving you an overview of the movie. And I think it's interesting how the UI is evolving to almost solve, uh, anticipate the many possible intentions of the user and provide you many different uh, search uh, user interface uh, and ranking experiences based on based on possible information needs you have. And then finally, I think another thing that we talked about was uh, sort of related to that search becoming increasingly specialized. Um, so you have like things like question answering where transformer models have been really uh, transformative. And um, you have e-commerce is being increasingly specialized in its own right. Uh, you have many subdomains in search ranging from conversational based approaches to search to things that verge on personalization and recommendation systems. 
And I think that combined with the UI changes and combined with how we're rethinking ranking and search engines is really gonna make the next five years a really sort of revolutionary time in this sort of AI powered search uh, world, so. Thanks, Doug. Um, Trey, how's the, the book going to cover this? I mean, what's your approach with writing the book and uh, covering what's what's next in the world of search? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll echo, um, you know, everything Doug just said. The, uh, I, I've got a, slightly different take just in, in the sense of, of how everything fits together. And I think the book will hopefully uh, lay that out nicely. But, uh, you know, historically, search engines have been very much keyword based, uh, like Doug mentioned with the inverted index. Uh, over the last handful of years, especially the last five years, there's been just an explosion of uh, innovation happening in the NLP space, um, specifically with the rise of you know, language models, transformers, the, the stuff Doug just mentioned. Uh, and in a lot of ways, most people are starting to see that as the future of search, uh, just in the sense that, you know, hey, keyword search is dead, but, uh, you know, these these new models are, are better and they're going to completely replace keyword search. Um, and I, I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. I think that uh, essentially, if, if you think of the intelligent ways that you can sort of piece together a search engine, an AI-powered search engine. Uh, you know, keyword search is a key piece of that, and you especially need that in the long tail. Uh, but also, you know, things like knowledge graphs, which have been used for years. You know, sometimes auto-generated using machine learning, sometimes manually generated, really have a, a really important place, I think, as well in in that picture. And the uh, transformer models and 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 the dense vector search capabilities uh, layer on top of that the ability to understand language and semantically understand a domain better than uh, some of those other approaches. And so I, I really think that it's about piecing all those together as well as taking both, uh, you know, traditional content understanding, the uh, an understanding of users and their behaviors and their actions in terms of signals, and also a, a really rich understanding of the domain of the business that um, your, your search engine is, is serving. Um, going back to the, the specialization, um, as Doug was mentioning. And so in the book, we sort of have it broken up into sections and we're going to walk through each of those topics. And one of my real goals with the book is being able to not just talk about these things independently, but to try to paint a picture of how they all can interrelate and be used uh, together to overall build a better system. So that, that'll be the goal. We're still uh, fairly early in on the book, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and obviously the space is evolving, especially in terms of uh, what's happening uh, on the, uh, the the dense vector and, and neural search side of things. But uh, by the time we get to the end of it, I think we will have um, that piece all um, reasonably figured out. Um, and then, you know, within two months of publishing the book, I'm sure the book will be outdated. But that's not a bad thing. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Trey. I won't embarrass yeah. you both by asking when the book's going to be um, available. Uh, I'm sure it'll be available when it's ready. It will be available uh, as soon as it's ready. Yep. As soon as it's ready. Fantastic. <laughs> Okay, so um, we've actually got um, a couple of questions from the uh, the Slack. Um, I'm just going to hop over there. We have a question from Tom Bergmans. Uh, thank you, Tom, uh, who asks, um, can AI-powered search replace for a part traditionally tuned relevance, or will it only be effective after traditional tuning is maximized? And maybe, Doug, you'd like to start answering that one. Yeah, sure. So um, I actually think they are... Um, you know, I'm work. I'm a we're consultant, so we like to think about pyramids and maturity models and stuff. I actually think that one of the a lot of the things that go into AI power search you actually build by doing manual relevance tuning. Um, a lot of the practices involving building probably the most the hardest problem that you do is how do you measure search quality, and so when you even when you're doing a manual solution, you kind of start simple, right? You start with how am I going to, uh, like this is a practice we go through with clients who have done nothing with their search. We say, okay, give me one area of search that you think is terrible. Let's go and gather some queries and just just start. I mean, just start with some, a dozen, couple dozen queries, see what's good, see what's bad, and then develop uh, what we call a judgment list. So a judgment list is basically, you know, which results are good and bad for, for queries. Um, and then we tune those up manually, 
I mean, that's always the starting point. We tune those up a bit manually. We kind of go about iterating on that and just seeing how things evolve. Um, and what you find is if you go through that process enough, you're going to start to ask yourself the question, shouldn't I be using machine learning to optimize this? And you're, as you're going through this process, you're going to ask a lot of questions. You're going to ask, OK, so I started out by just gathering maybe what my um, product person or the marketing person thought were good search results. You really should start to question that really early, probably, and to say, well, maybe we should go out and see how users are interacting with search results, bring in behavioral signals, bring, bring in different things like that, and start to ask, how could we use this? What other ways could we use to measure and sort of make those judgments more accurate? Um, how can we increase our maturity in that level? And then you might continue to tune things manually, but then you might say, this is a bit labor intensive. You know, I'm sitting here in, we use Cupid for this, uh, which many people may know about. I'm sitting here in Cupid. I, now I've got 200 queries. I'm trying to tune these. I'm trying to improve relevance. And how can I do this? To let, a, let a machine take this over. Um, and I think there's sort of two paths to go down there. I think you have, you have the foundation now. Now you can go in a direction of uh, within the search engine, maybe thinking about something like learning to rank. But I also think very important uh, is around the search engine, things like a lot of the work that you may have done manually is to basically do some rudimentary intent detection or to build rudimentary taxonomies and knowledge graphs. Um, and then you can start looking at building that out uh, with some more machine learning based approaches. So. All to say, I think they go hand in hand, actually. And I think one sort of sets you up for success for the other. Fantastic. Thanks, Doug. Um, Trey, do you, have, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, so I, I tend to start with the idea. So so like Doug was saying, you uh, what often happens is people start, they, they install a search engine, you know, solar, Elasticsearch, whatever it is, they, they get it in production and realize that um, they, they've accomplished a major feat, but the quality of the search results doesn't look that good. Um, you know, they, they start having all these pet queries that just don't work and then uh, essentially start one, one at a time knocking out tasks, adding synonyms, you know, maybe dealing with stop words um, over, and, and doing tuning of fields and boosts and all that kind of stuff. And then you know, sort of over the course of several years, eventually meander to ways of doing all of that with machine learning and automating it. Um, often by that point, the size of the search team has gotten excessively large, and a lot of people are doing really hard work that is hard to maintain. So I, I actually tend to start with the idea that some of these things should be automated from the beginning, because there's now well-established patterns for how to automate those things. Um, and that way, you can focus on the do adding domain expertise. Um, obviously, not everything can be automated, but um, I, I tend to start with, uh, you know, there, there's always a build versus buy aspect. You know, there's some commercial software that can do this stuff automatically. There's, you know, like our book that we're working on shows you how to do it. Um, there, there's lots of tools and techniques out there. Um, but I do think more and more so that um, we're going to see a world where a lot of the automation of these things is actually becoming commoditized and much easier to do. Um, therefore, people don't start manually tuning. They start with at least some level of automated tuning, and then they go in and fix wherever that you know machine-based tuning uh, w was off the mark. Great, thank you. I don't know that we're quite there yet, but I, th I think that's the direction we'll be heading. Fantastic. Okay, so we've got another question from from the uh, the virtual floor, uh, Torsten. Uh, has a question. When onboarding onto AI-powered search, how can I ensure that I don't just optimize my local maximum, uh, for example, when judgments are based on recent clicks? So Trey, do you want to kick us off with that one? Oh, boy. It's a, <clears throat> it's a fun question. Um, so going to the example you gave, Charlie, about results and, and clicks. So um, let's say you're doing something like learning to rank, where you are um, you know, taking search results, um, learning from a judgments list, uh, which results are good for any particular query, um, and then trying to, to optimize the, the tuning of your, your boost and, and whatever fundamental algorithm or classifier you're using to, to rank the results. Um, 
if you do something naive, like you know, take all of the documents that were clicked on and um, use those as an indication of, of a good result, and uh, then start uh, optimizing for that. Essentially, the the documents you, that were clicked to become your your uh, uh, positive uh, ratings for learning to rank. You're going to get in a, a giant mess because um, you do have inherent bias. For example, people tend to click on things in the top of a list even if they're not the best results. Uh, people. Um, and, and documents that were never seen, you know, will, will never get any boosts. And so, um, short of manually creating those lists, which some people do, um, going the op opposite end of the spectrum where you are just taking the results that people actually saw and clicked on is, is very problematic. And so, um, that's where things like uh, click models come into play, where, you know, instead of just looking at what people did click on, you know, there's lots of ways to take the, the click streams and actually figure out um, of the clicks or even the documents that were skipped over, you know, how can you understand what the user was actually intending and, and, and what they uh, and what they meant? So like for as one example, a, a very common click model is um, the, this notion of using kind of a, a click skip graph. So instead of just looking at uh, which document somebody clicked on, you also look at the documents that they skipped over. For example, if they clicked on the first document and then went to the you know third document, um, you know, several things, you know, they clicked the first one and they kept looking, you know, that they saw the second one and skipped over and went to the third one. And then, you know, that they clicked on the third one. And so depending upon your domain and the kind of search you're doing, uh, you might interpret those actions slightly differently, but in general, you know, uh, for a, for a common search use case, you might infer that result number three may have been the final answer. Result number two looked bad and result number one, you know, was interesting enough to click on, but not where the user ended up. And based upon that, you can use a model to then train the learning to rank algorithm. Um, I know, it, you know, then there's lots of other pieces of search in terms of a local uh, maximum um, that you might have to look at because there's there's lots of different AI power search techniques to do everything from automatically learning synonyms, detecting domain specific phrases, um, building a ranking classifier for learning to rank, um, doing sort of semantic or uh, statistical query parsing to determine phrases and to do inquiry expansion through things like a semantic knowledge graph. But in general, if you're talking about click signals and how you leverage those, it's really important uh, to add some nuance in terms of your understanding of what those signals actually mean relative to all of the other behaviors and actions. I and mean, I know um, uh, Doug uh, has, has studied a lot and, and uh, taught and, and built a lot with, uh, with click models as well. I don't know, Doug, if you've, you want to add any more there. Yeah, uh, click models are great because they overcome position bias. So uh, there, it's really one of their goals is if you're, if they know that there's a sort of modeling of, of whether or not users are examining results and if they're examining how what proportion of them are potentially clicking them. And examining is not just was this thing rendered on the page, is did this seem to, is this seeming to gather someone's attention? Because many things can be on my screen and I have many times missed the button. Someone is yelling at me to click, right? Um, and so that that can help a lot. Um, I think thinking about Torsten's question too, there's also this other bias, uh, which is presentation bias. And this is where you can get into a, like a vicious negative feedback loop with uh, sort of machine learning based search where, you know, basically what you said, Trey, people click on what they see they continue to interact with those results because that's what's what's shown to them. Um, and our models learn that that's, those are the best results because those are what I clicked on and this cycle just perpetuates. And this great result on the thousandth page is never seen or interacted with. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting ways to measure and, uh, and get at that. And I actually think the biggest uh, silver bullet any search team uh, has or can, and bring to bear is measurement. And I know with open source connections, the most mature search teams that we work with, they actually spend about, I would say 50% to 60% of their resources actually on measurement and maybe the rest on solutioning. And it's probably because they can have such confidence in measurement that they can then turn those, that fantastic foundation of training data into amazing machine learning based solutions to search. Um, and what they, what the best teams I've seen do, the most mature teams, they don't just have one way of gathering, say, uh, we use the term implicit judgments at OSC to, to 
to distinguish between if the explicit judgments that you get in sort of classic search like uh, Trek based uh, relevance challenges. Um, they don't just get like one view of a click model and how it's how the accuracy of different the relevance of different search results. They look at many sources of truth. So uh, you might have uh, a sense of what's relevant for a keyword based on another training set or knowledge graph out there. You might have uh, your A-B testing as another way of doing that. Um, you, another, you might have some people will differentiate between do, do a level of human relevance testing or human SERP evaluation where they're actually evaluating the search results page to say, is this good or is this bad in a lab setting? And then finally, I'm really interested in the field of active learning for this. So for those who don't know, active learning is basically modeling, basically, imagine your machine learning algorithms could have a research question about their training data. So I have all of these documents and all of these queries, and I have these, you know, we, I have all these examples where when someone searches for a movie, uh, there's a strong title match, but I have no examples of a weak title match, but a strong body match in this specific context. So maybe if I, you know, insert into my search results in the third result or something, something of that nature, that would be an area I could get a tremendous amount of gain on in my training data with, instead of just randomly drawing something or throwing it in there or trying to guess at what I should throw in there, I should really see where my training data is weak and where I can get more sort of signal on what's relevant and what's rel not relevant um, as another way to sort of combat that and sort of basically work on the biases in the data itself directly. Yeah, yeah. If, <clears throat> if, if I could um, piggyback on that a little bit, the um, you, you sort of introduced the notion of uh, diversity in search results a little mm. bit there. Um, I think that, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on, you know, with various customers and problems on the semantic search and, and really trying to interpret the intent of users in terms of the words they're using and, and the context in which they're using them. And uh, I, I get the question uh, oftentimes, and, and this refers back to the original question of, um, hey, so words can have different meanings, you know, you, like, I, I like to use the word driver, for example, you know, d depending upon the context, a driver could be, you know, a person who drives a, a car, an Uber driver, a truck driver, uh, it could be a kind of golf club, uh, it could be, uh, you know, something that you need to install on your computer for your printer to work, um, and so if you look at sort of the word driver within the context of, you know, C++ or embedded, uh, it takes on a very different meaning than if you look mm -hmm. at the word driver in the context of, uh, you know, golf or in the context of, um, you know, shipping, for example. And so mm -hmm. um, what's often the case is if, if you go just run a keyword search without having this semantic or sort of knowledge graph based understanding, um, you end up with a, a set of search results where result number one is a you know, CDL driver for, for a trucking company, and result number two is a golf club, and result number three is an Uber driver. And the problem is that most people, when they type in driver, they have a specific meaning that they're thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. When you show results like that, they think you're an idiot. They, they look at the search <laughs> results, they're all over the place, and they, they think your search engine absolutely has no clue what it's doing. Um, and the reality is, because you're doing a keyword match, those results all match the text, but it's much more important to match the meaning. So the question is, how do you display that to an end user? And, and oftentimes, if you think of uh, you know, field collapsing or grouping kind of capabilities, you, you can actually, if you can hone in on those um, disambiguated meanings and actually kind of group the results based upon those and show uh, the end user either one, hey, we've chosen a specific meaning and here's, here it is. And if you want other meanings, click here and we'll show them to you. Or even in the search results, just show, you know, sort of a couple of buckets or groups with the different meanings so the user can clearly see what you're doing there and then realize that there's multiple meanings and they can either filter their search results to get, get at one or they can just click on one of them and, and dive in. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that, uh, you know, that also gets to what you were saying about being able to take uh, 
to, to be able to take other results maybe further down in the list, like result number 1,000, and, and bring it up so that it actually gets some visibility. Um, when you've got multiple meanings, often one of those meanings will be shoved way down the list. And so if you can still find the best result that takes on that interpretation and, and show it, I, I think there's a lot of ways to both teach your customers uh, what you have available while showing that your engine actually is intelligent and understanding them. Um, and I think that, um, that that's another way to kind of uh, end up boosting things that otherwise might remain hidden. Fantastic, thanks. Um, actually, I, I heard you mention diversity there, and I know there's a panel later this week, um, which I think, uh, Doug, you're part of, well, on diversity yeah. and results, which we thought was such an important subject, we should get lots of people talking about it. So looking forward to that. So we've uh, we've got a, uh, another question from uh, Mia. Um, when when do you feel that uh, neural search, AI powered search, what what do we want to call it, versus traditional keyword search, is most useful? I mean, which use cases in particular do they solve? Um, who would like to to pick up that one? I, yeah, I can go ahead, Sharon. You, you go first. Sure. So um, I, I kind of mentioned alluded to this earlier, but uh, if you think of three, essentially three different major ways of interpreting um, a keyword that was typed in. You know, one being just traditional keyword search, let me max, match the text. One being more of a knowledge graph based approach where you, um, you, you take the text, you have some pre existing um, domain graph, um, you know, an ontology knowledge graph where, where you can go look that thing up and understand what it relates to and how it relates to your domain. And then the third being, uh, this this neural search or um, you know embedding um, language model uh, approach, um, you know, say I have a query like um, uh, uh, let's say um, fast food restaurants near uh, Berlin buzzwords or, or near Berlin, let's say, um, you know, a traditional keyword search um, is probably not going to do great with that because it's going to try to look up each of those individual words. It's only going to match documents that have the word near in them. Um, and and it's, not, it's not really understanding the logical connection between the things in the query. Um, a uh, neural search approach is going to understand what near means, is going to potentially understand what a restaurant is, and it's going to understand Berlin, um, but it's not necessarily you know, and, and it might be able to solve a, a surface level question like that, but it may not necessarily completely draw that inference. And if the query gets much more complex than that, where you've got, um, you know, something like, uh, you know, hamburger restaurants near my hotel at Berlin Buzzwords, there's no way that the engine is going to naturally understand the relationship between those things from a, from a language model. Um, so if you had a knowledge graph that could actually pull in those pieces of information and actually traverse the graph, you can draw a lot more relational type inferences, um, much simpler than you would with a neural model, which would have to be trained you know, multiple layers deep and, and really be able to do that. And so I, I would say that relational type queries really need more of a, a knowledge graph based approach, um, more general language queries. So question answer systems or something that needs to interpret and understand the, the, the semantic meaning of language or even domain specific language. Those are going to do better with a, a neural uh, approach, and then of course, people just type in random keywords or even you know lists of things that are very specific, and they're, they're keys or IDs or um, things that are really really far down the long tail. Um, neither um, or, or boolean operators or any of that kind of stuff. Ne neither the knowledge graph based approach nor the, nor the neural um, approach are really going to um, tackle those very well. And so I, I tend to think that those are three different ways of solving problems where, you know, traditional keyword search is really good with the long tail and does okay with the rest. Uh, Knowledge Graph is really good re with relational queries and understanding domain specific um, relationships. And then the neural approach is really good with just general language understanding. And if trained appropriately um, through, um, uh, transfer learning or what have you also able to dig into the semantics of domain but i think you really need to combine them um even like google when they released um the 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 bert and they released bert into their search results i think they i correct me if i'm wrong doug but i think that it's only being used is it is it 20 percent of queries actually leverage it it's, it's uh whatever queries over certain keywords is they said 
they said this is the largest impact and they met, you said 10% of our queries were impact, but it was their longest queries. 10%. So it was question answering kind of queries. Yeah, Hold on. I've, I've got the news article here. Let me pull it up real quick. Um, uh, Doug, what do you think? Yeah. I think it's I think it's interesting because I, I have so many, there's so many dimensions to take this kind of question. Um, one of the things you notice off the bat when you look at any sort of Trek competition when it's getting started, Trek or one of these IR information retrieval competitions, it's fascinating to me how so many people will just start with, try BM25, see how it works and it does pretty well. And it's so interesting to me how it's sort of like broadly above average, but not particularly amazing and not particularly terrible. <clears throat> and then people will try a bunch of things and they'll struggle to beat BM25. And then finally, for a given specific task, uh, they'll find some model that is very tailored to that task um, and is very specific to that task. But it's not as generalizable as something and as BM, like BM25. Um, I think that's really interesting. So people, I think transformer models are interesting because they seem to have found a niche in terms of being a bit more generalizable. Um, but at the same time, the other thing I notice is a lot of times when you, there was a really funny uh, thing on, and this has been true my whole career. There's a really funny thing on Hacker News, which was like this word does not exist.com. And it was all randomly generated uh, dictionary definitions. And I remember uh, 15 years ago, people would generate research papers with Markov models, or it's like, you know, this will generate your term paper for you. Just type in the subject and we'll use a Markov model to generate some gibberish. And occasionally you would get some interesting sounding sentences out of it. And I'm pretty sure the the quality of the model, I'm, I'm sure the quality of the models has improved since then. But we do a lot of cherry picking of these things. So when you look at something like this word does not exist.com, you might see that 50, I don't know what the, I haven't done the, a measurement, 30%, 50%, maybe 70% of the, of the terms are interesting. But the rest of them that are just like, oh, that was weird. Let me just hit refresh so I get something else that's interesting. Um, it's hard to know why, and it's hard to debug why. And I find like when you do search relevance work or any kind of even machine learning based work, you often want to know why things aren't working. And when you have a deeply complex model, that understanding that like, okay, we have this class, you might, you know, this happens every time we work with a client, this happens. It's like, we have this class of query that's extremely challenging. We don't understand why it's not working. How do we treat this kind of query? And if they all they had was like a BERT based approach, and they might say, "Oh, uh, trying to debug that would just you know be a nightmare because people are have a hard time sort of getting under the hoods of how these things work." And so I think I think we're gonna be in this place where there's gonna be an ensemble of techniques, and just like there's a diverse set of um, there's a diverse set of information needs. There's going to be a diverse set of treatments for those information needs. On the other hand, where I'm not sure, and this is where the future is hard to define, is you know we talk about a question because it has lots of language as being appropriate for a transformer model, and this this might segue into a privacy discussion that Trey has a lot of thoughts on. But what if instead of just the question and and we move beyond keyword search and we think about the whole everything we know about the user their location their history and we think about that as the input to a deep learning model that i'm not sure why a kind of complex you know deep learning model wouldn't be appropriate and then my final thought on the topic is one reason that uh keyword search is, is still prevalent and most popular is the technology is so commoditized, it's fast, it's super reliable, we can scale it to petabytes of data. 
Um, we can build on top of these sparse indexes all kinds of sophisticated things like knowledge graphs that get really close to solving the problem. Um, Jimmy Lin, had, who is an academic from the University of Waterloo, had a great paper, it was, you know, sort of un taking apart the neural hype and saying how some sort of classic query expansion gets pretty close to, to BERT-based approaches. He's since written an article that says, you know, neural hype maybe is, is real. Um, but at the same time, if I can have 90% of the value and still work on my boring solar Elasticsearch cluster, why would I re reinvent my whole search system to be able to do sort of a, a neural search-based approach? So that's like many complex thoughts, but yeah, the future is uncertain. We will see. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That, that leads into another question. Um, I don't much as much apologize to a couple of people whose questions I missed on Slack, but I've caught up now. But actually, uh, what you just said there, Doug, you mentioned uh, a couple of things. Uh, the uh, uh, Jens, or, uh, Jens uh, asks um, how to deal with the need of explanatory transparency on, on machine learning power search. For example, when a seller wants to understand the ranking position of her products in e-commerce. So here we've got, you know, is this stuff explainable? Yeah. What do you think? Trey? Go ahead, Trey. Do you want to go first, Trey? Yeah. Um, real quick to, to close that thread, I, I did look at the article. You're right. It was 10%. So um, just to put the transformer models in context, Google invested tons in this and rolled it out as the, the biggest innovation in their, uh, their platform in years. Um, and only 10% of Google queries are actually using these uh, these language transformer models. And even of those, um, it doesn't help all of them. It actually hurts some queries. It's like I know personally I've um, gone to Google and especially for long tail searches, like I was mentioning, I'll, I'll type things in and just be incredibly frustrated that I can't just find the keyword I'm looking for because I know it exists and I just want to find docs with that keyword. But the model is just reinterpreting what I'm saying. Um, so there's a long way to go. I do think that 10% is probably going to go up significantly over time. But um, it, I think it just reinforces that um, it's, it's an area that helps solve a certain set of problems, but it's not the, the panacea for everything. Um, and I, I do think um, that uh, coming back to this notion of explainable um, AI or you know, explainable um, algorithms here in search, that um, there, there's a lot, you know, deep learning is amazing and we're seeing leaps and bounds, um, you know, more improvements and, and tons of innovation there. Um, over the last couple of years than, than we've seen in a while. But the models are, in general, hard to interpret and hard to explain, which is a big problem in search. Uh, and so um, I, I think that we're going to see, um, it, even if you just go back to what I was describing earlier about sort of knowledge graphs versus um, the, these deep learning models, um, I very much believe that it's possible to translate between keywords and uh, vectors that represent those keywords semantically and knowledge graphs, which represent those keywords and, and their intent in terms of graph relationships. They're, they're not all three separate things. They're just three different ways to model information. And to the degree that we can actually um, generate all three of them automatically, um, it very much seems reasonable to me to be able to um, be able to take keywords auto-generate knowledge graphs. This is something I've worked on before with the semantic knowledge graph um, to, to auto-generate um, vectors that are, represent the semantic meaning of what's typed in. This is what BERT and the other transformer models are doing right now. Um, and if you can auto-generate all three of those, you can also take the documents that connect them and use them to interpret one in the context of the other. So uh, I haven't seen a ton of research um, or, or even like practical examples of this yet. But I, I very much expect this notion of explainable models um, to probably become easier over time because um, if, if you can explain one in the context of another and one of them is explainable, um, at least partially, not, not a perfect match, but you, you can approximate it. Um, it's almost like you're building a classifier for the deep learning model to tell you what kinds of problems it solved as the classification. Um, I, I very much think that's a, I don't want to call it an easily solvable problem, but a solvable problem. Um, and that'll allow us to potentially um, use the deep learning models as the really complicated model that understands everything, 
and then to be able to generalize it into much simpler models that can be readily deployed and much more easily controlled and explained. So I, I think that's probably where we're going as a field. Great, thanks, Trey. So Doug, what do you think? How are we going to be able to explain to people why uh, these models, why these uh, AI powered models um, have done? Yeah, I think, I think, so there, this, I think there's a lot of layers to this. I think one of the most important things a search engine can do um, is to reflect back what it thinks your intention is or or the things, it could be more than one thing. I think Trey used a good example with driver of here are the many senses of this. Um, I talked about sort of just searching for the never ending story. That seems like a straightforward query, but there are many things you could do with never ending story. Watch it, watch clips, just get an overview, learn about it. Um, and I often think that sometimes when people want explainable ranking, that's, that's sometimes what is coming out of that. And I actually think this is an area that um, is possibly areas around intent detection. And it's a, it, that itself is a huge topic. It's not just easily put into a bucket, but uh, what senses of a term people mean um, is an AI search problem that helps to, that might be deeply complicated to solve. And I may, you can see a situation where I may not be able to tell you why I think you mean this kind of driver because you're a developer, um, but I can at least show you that I think you mean software driver and you might infer that's because I'm a developer. And then it's not a terrible thing in that situation to, to be, you're completely transparent with the user. It's better than doing that and, and being clear that's what you think they mean and letting them refine than, um, than doing that and then just being confused. <clears throat> and then I think sometimes within that, and I think this is probably what Jens is getting at, is this idea of, well, okay, that's that's perfectly fine. We have people that their products, um, and people have this with SEO and Google. I mean, it'd be great if Google told me why my blog article showed up high for certain things and not high for other things. Um, they won't quite do that. Um, but for businesses we run, if many of the businesses we run are marketplaces and we are often satisfying suppliers and sometimes suppliers are customers in their own right, um, job search, this is a huge deal and people will come in and if they know too much about their, um, how things work, they might actually try to game the system. Um, that's a huge problem in a lot of search systems. <clears throat> some black hat SEO. On the other hand, there's a, there is value in demonstrating to people, you know, here are the things that you can do right to rank high in our search results. Um, and to give them a lot of transparency sort of in a white hat SEO place. Because I do think that um, sometimes the secret sauce in a search engine is not necessarily the technology, but the human, human and organizational dynamics around the search engine we're all working really hard to make our content rank high in Google. And Google get, get, does give us information on what we can do to rank high in Google. Um, and they do punish us when we try to abuse the system. So what can we do? I mean, we can probably set up an established set of rules and standards. And then instead of necessarily explaining how the model works, we could say, here's how in this context, here's how you're doing against these rules and standards. Um, and <clears throat> Trey and I both have some experience in, in job search, but job search is, is front and center where you're like, is your job posting high quality? Did you list these mm -hmm. kinds of salary requirements? Did you, are you, uh, you know, listing the skills in a clean way that is going to make things more discoverable? Um, Trey, you probably have some thoughts on on that. I know from your career builder experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah I used, used to run search over career builder. Yeah, we <clears throat> spam or you know job posters wanting to game the system so they show up at the top of the results was constantly a problem. So you know we we built some custom uh, similarities for uh, for for Lucene that uh, you know essentially um, you know if you think of uh, 
BM25 or you know, even just classical TF-IDF where you know, as the number of times the term increases in the document, uh, the, the score increases. Even with BM25, it still increases just slowly. Um, I, I can't get into the specifics, but we definitely, you know, if you cross a certain threshold, your relevance would actually decrease. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's so sort of a, a spam, think of it like a spam um, penalizer built into the ranking formula because it was necessary because, you know, depending upon which domain and context, you know, if, if I've got a sales job and there's, you know, millions of sales jobs and I want to be on the first page, you just put sales in your document, you know, 5,000 times and you're going to be at the top of the first page. And so, you know, they're, they're, those, things like that are easy to com combat. Um, but there's also keyword stuffing where you, you just want eyeballs. Um, you know, so the, the, you know, so some recruiters, it's it's butts and seats. They just they just need as many people to apply as possible. It doesn't matter about the specialization. So yeah, there there's a lot of ways there. Where we're you know machine learning classifiers can can really help in some of those situations as well. Okay, so sometimes you want to explain things, and sometimes explaining things may be a bad idea. Yep, depending on the audience. Yep. <laughs> so we've got another question here from uh, Thomas. Um, we have. Uh, is implicit feedback data enough to train a semantic search model? And if not, what else could be helpful if you want to exceed the performance of a text-based search engine? I think, I think yes. But Trey, I'd be interested because you, I know you are a passion of yours is building knowledge graphs automatically. Yeah, and that yeah. Seems very semantic search related. Yeah, yeah. So, so I have this debate with people all the time about what semantic search means. You know, semantics is just is, is meaning. So, any kind of search where you're better understanding the meaning or the intent of the user is really semantic search. Um, historically, there have been knowledge graphs as a way to solve that. More recently, the transformers and, and um, dense vector stuff. Um, but if if you peel it back. Um, there's lots of different specific problems. I think of them as building blocks that go into making a semantic search system. For example, uh, you need to understand specific phrases so that you're not parsing every keyword out as an individual piece of text, but you're understanding when words are, are phrases. And so let, let's take that one problem. Um, how might I identify phrases? Well, I could take all of my text um, and I could mine my text and try to use um, look for statistically improbable phrases or, or, or any number of techniques to, to identify phrases for my text. But I'm going to have a lot of noise there. Uh, the other way I could do it is I could look at my query logs. So if somebody comes in and they are consistently typing software engineer over and over as a phrase, then I can, from mining my query logs, realize that that is a domain specific phrase that I need to learn the meaning of. And I can add it to a list, and that list can be, then be used. Um, uh, so that anytime somebody comes into the future and they type in that phrase, I can identify it as a phrase. Um, the implicit nature of that, if you're talking about you know, user signals and what the users are doing, is, is certainly enough to solve that problem. You could also solve it with documents, or you could solve it with both, and then look at the intersection of what is both in your content and also your users are searching for, and then you get a really nice clean list that matches both the supply and the demand. Um, that's one problem. Take another problem. Um, misspellings. So if I want to identify misspellings in search, I can look at my documents, which are full of lots of words. And if I recommend spelling corrections for my documents, they might look a little crazy, um, but you, just with a lot of noise. I could do the same thing. I could mine my query logs. Um, anytime somebody typed in M-A-N-G-E-R, um, and then you know, 10 seconds or five seconds or two seconds later typed in M-A-N-A-G-E-R, so correcting manager to manager because they misspelt it. I can use that and build a machine learning model that can automatically learn spelling corrections from commonly misspelled terms uh, from that implicit data from, from, from my user signals. And that tends to generate some of the best um, misspellings, uh, correct, cor spelling correction list um, for a given domain, assuming you have enough signals. Um, and I could further go down that list. You can look at you know, automatic query rewrites. You can look at um, uh, synonym expansion, identifying synonyms. You like you, you could sort of go through each of these. I'll call them NLP problems. They're they're search NLP problems. You can go through each of them one by one, and most of the time you can solve them either with your content or with your sig user signals, um, and optimally with both. And so um, the the short answer to the question I think is yes. Um, you can absolutely leverage implicit judgments um, to automatically generate these building blocks that are necessary to, to build out a semantic search system. Uh, the higher you set your 
thresholds in terms of number of users running the searches and what have you, the higher the quality goes to the point where um, if you go really, really high, then you have almost no noise, but you're missing a lot of, of input. So where I think the, the human element has to come in there is um, if you don't have enough signals, you're going to have to augment it with, with your understanding. If you don't have enough content, you know, same kind of thing. But, um, you know, I, I absolutely believe you can build a semantic search system without a lot of manual input, assuming you've got enough traffic and assuming that you've got enough data. If you don't have enough data and or you don't have enough traffic, then you don't have a lot of options. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think uh, I think I think a lot of people once I think there's like this sweet spot where there's a combination of sort of an unsupervised data source like uh, Wikipedia. Uh, or, you know, maybe that's a good starter, starter point or your own corpus. Um, and semantic, that might, whatever semantic search assets that turns into, whether it's a knowledge graph or like some vector-based model like BERT or WordDevec, that can be often be a good starter point for a lot of people. <laughs> but the, the real magic happens when you can combine that with your own query logs and behavioral signals. And you can draw connections between <laughs> this phrase, we saw an interaction between this phrase or concept, which I might recognize from like Wikimedia, but in this context, it's connected to this kind of document, which may be in some kind of vector space, it clusters over here, which is a little bit different than Wikimedia. So you learn these like almost geometric relationships between the phrases in your, uh, in your queries and your specific corpus which may be a little bit different than might what it might be in like a Wikipedia or some other starter uh, starter set. Um, that's almost like thinking about it maybe from a, how you might start with a simple word of ec or glove or or something like that. Um, I also think about semantic search in terms of a hierarchy. If I, I'm thinking about this purely from a, a text-based point of view, I like to think about this as a, as a hierarchy. Uh, and you, people always start with keywords. We have keywords, right? I think the next level up from keywords is phrase detection. So phrase detection being sort of uh, basic collocations, like I can detect that I can do compounding, decompounding. I can detect uh, uh, common phrases. I can see that AI powered search is a phrase without necessarily tying it to any conceptual relationships. I just know there is a thing called AI powered search. <laughs> Um, and then I think you move up from that and people will start to think in terms of taxonomies or managed vocabularies, which tend to be in my mind, hierarchical. Um, and where that has a lot of, uh, you can, you can learn these things. And it's funny because, you know, what do you call machine learning? What do you call AI? You know, AI is what you call machine learning and PowerPoint, right? Um, a lot of these things are just statistics. And you can find statistical patterns both in query queries and um, and your own corpus that that point at these things. Um, when you move up to managed vocabularies or taxonomies, and you're thinking about things hierarchically, um, there are algorithms that that look at this too. I, I gave a talk at Lucene Revolution many years ago. I think it's called it's a mouthful. I think it's called taxonomical magical semantical search or something. But it was about this concept of uh, sort of automatically deriving hierarchical taxonomies out of corp a con corpus and query logs. Um, and those are straightforward tricks, just more or less based on statistical significance and set math, right? You can do a lot with simple math. Um, and what's nice about even there is that before you get into any complicated sort of relational uh, things between concepts, um, a lot of how people search tends to be in this hierarchical fashion. I think it's really interesting that if, if you go to a medical search engine and none of us are doctors, and what are we going to search for to see if their search is any good? We're probably going to type cancer or we're going to type, I don't know, Tylenol. That's probably not what an experienced user of that system searches. And so what happens is we often strike out with very broad queries that tend to sit at this high level of semantical, I guess you would say broadness. A lot of head queries are this way. And we're gonna, you know, we talked started talking about diversity and I'm gonna do the diversity panel later this week uh, that I hope everyone comes to because it's gonna be awesome. Um, 
But when you do that initial strikeout query, something that's hierarchical can say, okay, here are all the senses of what that intention might relate to. And there are many ways of thinking about a hierarchy of intentions, maybe different actions, maybe it's different concepts. <laughs> um, but cancer, oh, we have all this stuff on the, all, all these different kinds of cancers. And you might start to register in your mind, you're learning the vocabulary that the system understands as you're searching these broad terms, and then you refine, people often refine more narrower into more refined, narrow, narrow concepts. And as you get narrower and narrower, it becomes less of a, let me show you all the possible intentions that you might have, and more about truly like relevance ranking, where it's like, let me try to get you close as possible to what you're actually saying, because that you seem to really strongly knowing what you want. Um, and then I think the next layer in the hierarchy uh, is the knowledge graphs that you know Trey sort of alluded to before, where you get into relational um, inferences between different uh, concepts. And all of these things, I think the best way to do them is a combination of implicit data. Uh, and I would say, or implicit data from your query logs. And I would say probably two sources of, of uh, unsupervised text corpus data, which is something outside this, your search system, because that might represent more what the naive searcher is doing and something related to your corpus, because uh, that's going to get at what your, uh, at least what the people who produce your content think your search system is about. And sort of the intersection of the three things are, are often helping, most helpful at getting at, at that most common sense. Yeah. I I would say the d depending on the uh, domain and how specialized it is, the mm -hmm. uh, referencing something like you know the Wikipedia corpus or you know any sort of external um, knowledge based can either be incredibly useful um, or incredibly non useful. Um, That's a good point. It, yeah, because the the words can take on entirely different meanings to, depending upon the specialization. Um, so if, if, if you, and I, and I would even tie this back to the transformer models in some ways, when, when I think of the vectors that come out of those models, um, they're, they're essentially modeling two kinds of things. They're modeling the ability to understand language generally. Um, and then they're modeling the, an understanding of the relationships between the text and the items that are in the domain that the model was trained on. And so mm -hmm. you can take BERT out of the box and throw it in your search engine, and it's going to do a really good job at, at understanding questions, understanding people, places, things, um, general kinds of linguistic relationships between things, let's call them. Um, but if you're dealing with a, you know, um, you know, if you're dealing with bio, you know, biomed, if you're dealing with, you know, careers, if you're dealing with, you um, uh, medical, like any very specific domain, if, if, if the BERT model was trained on a general corpus, it's not going to do well at all in terms yeah. of interpreting those things, unless you do some transfer learning on content from the domain. So I, I think that general rule applies regardless of what kind of um, technique you're using. Um, if, if you're d building a web search engine, then Wikipedia is going to be awesome. If you're building a very specific finance vertical website, it's going to probably be very misleading. I think right. we saw that. Just one quick comment on that. We saw that the, uh, my colleague, Max Irwin, built a BERT search engine using Open Source Connections blog. And I forget what it was that he searched for. Maybe you know, maybe it was solar. I, I don't know if this is it. But he typed in solar. And there was definitely a bias towards light and light-based mm -hmm. things because solar, S-O-L-R, you know, uh, seem to be slightly tied to solar panels. And, you know, yeah. solar is a fairly unique term in our domain. Uh, that means nothing that the in the general sense. So I thought that was, uh, there's all kinds of stories like that, that every time, it's funny, we had the same exact stories 10 years ago when we were playing with latent semantic indexing, sort of naively trained on a general purpose too. So it's yeah. it's gotten better, but it's sort of the same lessons. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to move on to another question here, and uh, there may be a short answer to this one. There may be a long answer. So Atita asks, um, no matter if search is powered by AI, machine learning, or normal search, isn't it true that the data, the source data, de decides the quality of your search? So if the data is not clean, no matter what you invest in, you may never get your desired results. Or, or 
do you think AI powered search could could outsmart this? <laughs> do you want to take that, Doug, or do you want me to? Well, yeah. If by data we mean training data, that's that's absolutely true. I mean, it's very much garbage in, garbage out. If we're supervised problems, um, if we mean the corpus itself, well, maybe. I mean, I I think about basically the semantic search conversation we were just having. And let's say uh, uh, I'm searching, I'm searching music by mood. Now you could say, is the, are the songs bad because, you know, Spotify or whoever didn't label them all by mood and that is a bad data problem? Or is it that we have to find the vector space that maps between the query of the mood queries and the and the audio. And there is some way to learn that a sad song look that a sad song, if we if someone searches for sad and they click on certain songs, then we can, you know, sort of get an association between that concept of sad and a certain kind of song that there seems to be some commonality. And then we have we solved a data quality problem? I mean, you could extend that to like really terrible data that someone's put, I mean, another place where people have data quality challenges might be enterprise search because enterprise search is kind of always unloved by everyone who wants to use it. It's a, it's a place where people will just write content. They're not even caring about it being searchable. Um, and it's the same kind of thing where it's like, when someone searches for TPS report, okay, what kinds of things are they interacting with? And can we learn almost a relationship between a set of queries and what a TPS report or report might even mean? So. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. The I think of search in a lot of ways as supply and demand, right? The the demand is the queries coming in from end users and the supply is the documents you have. Um, it's entirely possible to build models that interpret the user's query based upon what they meant. And then when you go to actually execute the search, you get no results or you get very few results. So the it's still important that your content itself is, um, I, I wouldn't use the word clean, I would just say, um, it's there and you can access it and you know your model can map into it in some way um but uh yeah if, if you can't train the model to understand your user's intent at all then you end up with the i'm just going to throw some keywords at a search engine and hope the bag of words in bm25 gets me what i'm looking for uh, which is not an invalid approach it's just um a bit dated at this point um, but yeah like optimally your your models are clean and your data is clean and then everybody's happy but um, sometimes you have to take what you can get. Thank you, thank you. So uh, moving on, we have a, a question from uh, uh, Philippe. Um, how do you feel AI power AI powered search could impact personalized search? Do you think do you see search getting even closer to real time recommendations? Mm -hmm. You want to take that try first? Yeah, I'll take it. So um, I think of. So the, the goal of the search engines to, you know, I guess academically to, um, uh, mo you know, help the user with their um, information need, right? Um, I, I think of it as, you know, we need to understand the user's intent, and then we need to, you know, return results that match that intent. And so I, I think of user intent in, in three dimensions: the the content understanding, the user understanding, and the domain understanding. Um, on the user understanding, you know. If somebody comes to my website, let's say I'm uh, like Best Buy, for example. Um, somebody comes to my website and they search for a, uh, you know, they search for refrigerator. And then they start clicking on results and they click on three different refrigerators that are all stainless steel. Um, maybe they click on five, you know, four of them are by Samsung, the other one's by some other brand. Um, and then they come back, you know, an hour later and they search the website for microwave. Should I, A, return them a generic microwave or B, return them a stainless steel microwave made by Samsung. Um, maybe all of the results are exactly the same. It's just how you rank them, the ones you show at the top of the list. Um, I would argue in most cases, 
as long as you're showing the same results, um, moving the ones at the top of the list that we believe the user is most likely to be interested in um, probably makes the most sense if you're trying to you know, land a sale. Um, now, there's nuances of that. You don't want them to then go search for um, uh, iPhone and then you know, get a, a Samsung, you know, I, a Samsung phone coming up instead because we've learned that they prefer the brand Samsung. You know, like so. So there's things like that you have to be very careful about. But um, the when you say AI power search versus personalized search, I would actually say that personalized search is is a key part of AI powered search. So in the book, there there's a whole you know chapter and section we talk about collaborative filtering and real time recommendations and and personalized search. That that's that's a key aspect of what we're um, tackling in the book and and really focusing on. Uh, of course, how you do it, but more so, how do you do it in such a way that you don't mess up the other search results? Like the uh, the, the phone example I gave you, where you know we don't want to return a Samsung phone for an iPhone search um, because out, out of all of the areas of AI powered search, I would say that personalization is the one where um, you're the most likely to really mess up and um, mm -hmm. get your users angry because you're personalizing the results to them, but they may not want that. And especially given the context, it may actually make the results worse. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think you should do it in a very nuanced way that can help the users see at the top of the list the things that they are definitely the most interested in while not overstepping to essentially become recommendations that override what the user is actually telling you. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, um, it's a tricky area and I think, um, especially as we get into this world of being conscious about privacy, which I know Trey is an area you're passionate about, but I, I think, yeah, I think I think a lot about the, uh, I think a lot about, it's nice when I see a recommendation system and it's very transparently a recommendation system. And it's it's this, we have, we have based on your browsing history or similar to, this specific item or items like this that we think you specifically would like, then it's like, okay, I'm logged into this website. It has my history. I know it, it what it knows about me. And I have a sense for what this piece of the UI is, is based on. When I use search, that's a different proposition because what I, it's like when I walk into, uh, uh, I mean, every people use this metaphor a lot, but when you walk into a, a store and you see the clerk, and you say, I kind of want to know what your, uh, you know, show me your washing machines or, or what, uh, maybe a better example would be fashion. Like I want to buy a sports jacket. Now it's super important that they take you to the sports jacket aisle and they show you the, I'm showing you this because they're sports jackets, sort of a little, you know, the gravy on top as if the salesperson might somehow remember you and and you have a relationship with this person and they are able to sort of maybe make some suggestions um but you wonder if a that should be called out explicitly in the search somehow or b that should almost be like off to the side as like a sidebar ui as like you know as we were saying search uis are evolving pretty rapidly right now it's not just a 10 hot links it could be like Here's 10 hot links for, or here's four hot links or whatever. Here's a grid of, of sports jackets. Um, over to the side, sports jackets based on your browsing history. And I, I think a lot about if we're reflecting back to the user, um, that sort of in, interpretation of their intent and making that conversation very transparent about here's what I put in and I, am I getting out what I want? And are they showing me, um, are they explaining why they're showing me what they're showing me? And if they start doing something crazy, then I'm gonna become sort of increasingly distrustful of the of the system, not only from a relevance perspective, but also just from a trust perspective. Thanks. Um, I've got a question here that I think, um, Doug, it may, maybe, uh, maybe one for you, but, um, uh, John asks, John Blythe asks, um, where should a team start in trying to get AI powered search? What is the best point of entry and the greatest value for the efforts? Where should a team start? Yeah. I think that's a great. Obviously, buy your book. 
Yeah, buy all the books. Um, <clears throat> I think the for me, I think one of the the biggest things. So there's a there's a lot of thing. There's a lot of places you could start. Um, I think one of the biggest things you should be doing is thinking about the pipeline between our users, your users' interactions with search results, and translating that into sort of a, a ground truth set. Uh, that's a great place to start because, you know, that is going to be the uh, uh, that is going to be the, the source sort of the foundation of anything you do with search. You're going to be able to evaluate offline whatever crazy ideas you have. I think uh, your organiz and if you do that, um, you can also another area that I see people start that's not super heavyweight and not super heavyweight in analytics is with really simple intent detection. Um, and intent detection, like I said, can be a broad, broad category, but simple things like, uh, I know you want things in this category because I see that people often click this facet or when prompted to do this thing, they take this action. So I'm just going to take that action for you. Um, like that's like a really simple training set for a, a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty well solved NLP problem for a long time. We don't need transformers even for that. Um, and I think those are like, those are almost like two bits. If you started with those two things, then you'd have sort of the foundation for with the, with the uh, sort of the judgments and everything, you'd have the foundation for uh, doing learning to rank basically. And then with the other side, you're starting to get the foundation for doing more complex things, understanding queries and sort of the sort of the semantic search side of things almost. Um, and that what you want, that that's a great place to get started. The hardest thing that you'll you'll find is when you get to this place of thinking about machine learning, I often think when an executive thinks about machine learning or you know, someone in a high level role, what they really are thinking about is I want to be extremely data driven in our company's thinking. And machine learning is sort of like by a definition data driven. Um, but I think as you get started and start having successes, you can actually start to steer some of the things that get in the way of machine learning based search, which is the culture of the organization where some of these things, and this has been true of search relevance, not just machine learning, you know, AI powered search. Uh, you re you kind of have to get the organization in this mindset of being very experimentally driven because you're going to find that you're going to try some things you're going to work, you're going to try some things you're not going to work, and it's got to be okay to have um, the foundation for for trying and experimenting and, and failing and then learning from your failures and then moving on to the next thing. You want to do that quickly and not spend six months, you know, building something and then getting it into production, realizing it, you know, it failed at A-B test. <clears throat> yeah, makes sense. And, it, and I was going to say to the, you know, wh where should you start? Um, we uh, obviously, you know, as they said, you know, buy, buy the book and you know, put my, my marketing hat on for a second. Um, I think actually mm -hmm. Manning has a couple of uh, free uh, ebook codes for the book. So uh, maybe afterwards we can go through all the questions in the Slack channel um, and, uh, you know, g give a couple of those out to people. Um, so th there's an incentive to post some more good questions, everybody. Um, but I do think the other piece of it is with any technology decision, you, you do have a build versus buy decision. So, you know, if you've got an internal search team that's really good and you've got a bunch of data scientists and they're ready to go, then, you know, look at the book, look at the techniques there, develop your own techniques and, and hit the ground running. Um, a lot of organizations, the, there's a small search team, they don't have the, um, the, the internal expertise and it's, it's hard to come by. So, you know, I would say reach out to somebody, you know, like an open source connections or like a search kernel or like, you know, whoever, and, and they can probably help you build. Um, you know, the third option is, you know, there, there's lots of vendors out there building um, enterprise software that does a lot of these things already. Um, you know, I, I just came from Lucidworks and, you know, their, their Fusion product does it, you know, there, there's other competitors as well. So um, you, you kind of have to figure out what's best for your business. Um, if you just want to put your toe in the water and get started, um, you know, we can definitely help with that. The, the book, I think, will, will walk you through that. Um, there, there's lots of resources out there. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's um, it's a lot of fun and a lot of investment. But I, usually, in the end, 
you come out much better off by automating this stuff and making your systems more intelligent than by you know manually tuning and building large teams of manual tuners for years. Um, so uh, in, in my experience. Um, I, yeah. I will add actually just a, 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 an additional comment that I think when you have started your journey, um, talk about it, blog about it, write about it. You know, Even if you're starting at the very beginning, document your mistakes. Yeah. Tell the rest of us how you're getting on and come back to an event like this, perhaps, and tell us all your successes and failures, because I think that's a hugely important thing that people need to share their experiences so we can all learn. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure both Doug and I would, would say that we've learned a lot more from other people trying things and failing and succeeding um, than, you know, from our own failures and successes. But uh, they're, they're, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we, we want to learn from you. too. <laughs> and also the people who are best equipped often to talk or write about something are the people doing it in, for the first time and because after you've done it for 20 years or however long you sort of like it's become second nature to you and it's like try and do I, I once i recently had to explain some long division to my son or something and it's like oh i, I can know how to do this but i don't know how to explain it to anybody <laughs> <laughs> yep well that's a challenge a lot of us are facing at the moment certainly yeah so Moving on to our, our, our next question, um, we have a question from a, a, a young man called Nathan Day. You may have heard of uh, Doug. Um, he um, he says, uh, "How do you see the increased compute required for these dense vector operations impacting search?" And an interesting one: Is it a case that small companies might be left behind because you'll need a certain scale or budget before you can actually realize the benefits? Yeah, that's a. I think that's really interesting. Um, I think that speaks to the, you know, the compute question. It's really, there's a pretty, you know, if I had my, maybe a good, a fun interview question that I've thought about uh, is telling someone to design a nearest neighbor data structure from scratch. If you want like one of those sort of like half a day Google whiteboard, uh, whiteboard interview questions, because it's a really interesting question. Um, and what, what that problem is, is I can like, if we might have uh, a billion documents in our index, each of those billion documents might be represented by a 300 dimensional vector or, or something. Now, if I wanted to take a query 300 dimensional vector and sort of get the billion, the top 10 documents out of those billion that are closest, uh, that's going to involve like if I just directly computed that, that is a direct scan of a billion documents to do a vector, like a, a cosine similarity or something, um, or Euclidean distance, just to get like the, the closest things and then return those. Uh, now, many of you may have seen, many people may know that uh, there are sort of re-ranking approaches where people will first, they'll search with like DM25 and they'll say, okay, well, maybe I have some stuff in the ballpark. I'm going to do this. I'm going to scan the top thousand, uh, much like you might do with the learning to rank model. That's it's very common. And then I'm going to bring up to the top of the best stuff in there. <clears throat> now, I sort of think we have that backwards. I sort of feel like we might, the best solution is probably first to do something in that vector based world and pull back the candidates. Because like I said, ever since I've been doing anything that's in this dense vector space, you can cherry pick really interesting, good, smart stuff, but you can also find like complete failures and you're not entirely sure why sometimes. Um, but you you almost like get this good first set that's, you know, maybe maximizes the recall of good stuff that a text-based approach wouldn't get because text search is too strict. It wants exact text messages, even, even maybe even after we apply our, our knowledge graphs and our taxonomies and stuff. Um, and I sort of am wondering if we have these switched. And so what a lot of people have been working on for a while and they're, you know, uh, was it Spotify has annoy, which is one approach. There's a uh, hierarchical, hierarchical navigable. Uh, what, what is it? There's the, a lot of graph based models. Are you, do you know the name of the algorithm I'm trying to think of? Um, I think it's NSFW, not na navigable hierarchy, NH, navigable, HNSW. Small it has, has a term small world graph or something. HNSW. Yeah. 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 I'll go look it up. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And basically the idea is, you know, much in the same way that 
for years, we've had this inverted index data structure that could tokenize a document with the terms and basically take a term and point at every document that term occurs at. And we can do that blazingly fast. And Lucene is, you know, really, you know, burning, you know, CPOs go brr whenever Lucene runs, right? And um, and so we don't have, we're still working on that with, with uh, sort of the dense vector approaches. How do we take a 300 dimensional vector and sort of put it in a data structure so that if I take a query 300 dimensional vector, it will efficiently do a kind of lookup in that space and pull back 10 documents or 100 documents or whatever that are close. And then maybe, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't how the world works. But then maybe we think about BM25 as like one aspect of a, of a feature for a learning to rank model, or maybe it's it's something else entirely, or maybe that's input into some other deep learning model for re-ranking. Um, but I sort of think I sort of think search technologies are gonna um, are at this sea change in terms, you know, vector search uh, that might enable that kind of future. So. Yep. And, and to, to to piggyback on that, just for for anyone listening who's not familiar with how um, this dense vector search works. Um, uh, essentially, you, you, you have a field in the search engine, a vector field, <clears throat> that is representing some number of dimensions. It's usually like a, it's a float. You know, maybe have, like Doug mentioned 300. So I would have a field in the search engine with 300 float values um, representing each of the 300 dimensions. Um, and then at, at query time, um, you essentially can take, you can take a query and map it into another 300 dimensional vector. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you're, you're doing a similarity between that vector at query time of 300 dimensions that represents the query and the vector on each document or potentially multiple per document um, representing the, the, the meaning there and you're doing a similarity. So cosine similarity is very common, but you're essentially calculating um, how, how similar are the vectors that are in the document versus the query vector. Um, that process, um, like Doug mentioned, is very expensive because if say you've got 10 million documents in your index, there's no way to, you know, like with an inverted index where you're just literally looking up that uh, a postings list that has been pre-generated, there's no way with the uh, the dense vector similarity to, to do that. You have to do essentially a scan of all the documents. And so the way this is usually solved in the search engine is by doing um, uh, a nearest neighbor filter before you do um, that similarity. So essentially, you know, maybe it's clusters. Maybe it could be any number of ways that you you generate these these uh, let's call them clusters. These, these um, neighborhoods. You you filter down to the documents that are the, the closest, and then you only do the uh, the similarity of those vectors on a small subset of your overall documents. That's the re-ranking step Doug was mentioning. So that's the typical approach that's followed. Um, HNSW, hierarchical navigable small world, that's what it is, um, uh, is one example that you know, tends to be you know, near the cutting edge um, where you can actually encode those, um, those uh, neighborhoods into the index itself. That's something that's being worked on in Lucene right now um, to make that filtering and then the re-ranking um, uh, just a much more seamless operation. Um, one of our um, one of our um, wonderful colleagues in the Slack has just posted uh, some uh, references to that. So okay. thank you. Um, so the answer is um, yes, it's going to be expensive, but if you're smart, you can probably reduce the expense. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just post quickly in the Slack this uh, the issue we see the nine thousand four. And I know Trey, you have a corresponding solar issue to bring some yeah. some scoring to uh, some you know basic vector similarity of solar function queries too. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff being worked on in the space. There's, you know, Elastic Open Distro has their uh, ANN algorithm, approximate nearest neighbors. Um, Elastic has their XPAC uh, edition uh, under a basic license that is a more just doing a cosine similarity, more the re-ranking side of things. Mm -hmm. um, there are also things outside of the Lucene world like Vespa. Um, I know, uh, uh, I think Han Zhao is how you say his name, is working on a search engine called Gina, J-I-N-A, which is supposed to be neural first. Um, there, this is uh, one of the reasons I, I'm sort of fascinated. We're at a pretty important uh, inflection point in search engines. And 
I think we may have a, a broadening, might get a, a flowering of new search engines, which I think is is exciting and actually really promising. Yeah, I, I was going to say two two things. One on on um, I, I saw in the uh, the Slack channel, I think uh, Uwe Schindler was asking about um, the vector capabilities coming to to Lucene, sort of what they mean. Um, so the, I think those originally were came from the elastic search implementation uh, one thing i will say mm -hmm. uh, hopefully i don't start like a flame war here but um the uh i actually fundamentally um i don't like the notion that a document like a field in a document just represents one vector of meaning um mm -hmm. the, i'm working on a patch for solar um i've just with uh work transitions and stuff haven't worked on it much in the last uh, month or so but um, hopefully I'll get back to it at some point. Um, but the, the, the approach I'm taking is think of it more as a multi-value vector field. So, you know, when, when I'm representing a document as a vector, I'm essentially taking all of the content in that document and generating one vector of, of numbers that represents the document. But the reality is, um, instead of thinking of it as, you know, a document vector, you can think of it. I, I just like the generic term of thought vector. Um, mm -hmm. and, to, to me, a thought vector could be a, a, a vector that represents the entire document. It could be one that represents, you know, a, a paragraph or, you know, even a sentence or individual words. And so if you think that each word could be represented as a vector, or maybe each phrase or each paragraph, um, if you could have a multi-value vector field, then that would allow you to, when you match from a query to documents, not have to match the entire document and sort of, of its averaged meaning but to be able to actually match specific parts of documents that might matter more than others. Um, and so the, the, the implementation I'm working on, on on the solar side right now is um, essentially allowing multiple value, a multi-valued vector field, which I think um, gives a lot more opportunities in terms of the way that you can actually represent um, content. Um, so um, I, hopefully whatever's being built into Lucene, I'm sure it will start with, you know, one vector per document, uh, like the elastic implementation. But uh, I hope that as things are being built out, we can mentally think of a model where they could actually be multi-valued fields. And that's, that's not super hard at the um, vector being represented and, and uh, scored for, for the, the re-ranking piece, um, as Doug mentioned. But when mm -hmm. you start getting into things like embedding, like, like HNSW, embedding in the core index structure, um, the way a, a vector is represented. Um, I think it gets a lot harder if we don't think about upfront being able to support multiple values or multiple vectors, I should say, um, in the field. And, and if we get sort of in a, a rigid m model of thinking that there's one ve vector per field within a document, I, I think that significantly limits some of the things that as, as an industry we need to be able to do in this space in the coming years. So just throw that out there. Um, I'm sure that'll start hopefully some, some other conversations, but I think that's a really, uh, well, that makes me think of, um, almost makes me think of highlighting. Like we could have highlighting snippet ranking where we have a vector around a paragraph and yeah. we're like, this pair, okay, here's a score for it. Maybe there's a score for a document, but there's yeah. also uh, a score for the paragraph of the document. Um, and I'm, now I'm imagining, I don't know if, David Smiley still working on highlighters, but his head might be exploding thinking about uh, how we are gonna do vector-based highlighting, but yeah. we'll have to figure out how to rank snippets with vectors potentially. There's a lot of really interesting applications and, and we, uh, without having multiple values per field within the documents, we, we cut off a lot of them. So just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, um, okay, that, 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 that sounds very cool. Uh, I could see you cool. going off inventing stuff, so. Yeah, let's uh, do That's that. That's always the funnest part. Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to uh, just give you one more question. Then there's, a, a, there's something we've got. Uh, I know you want to talk about as well. But uh, Daniel, uh, Daniela uh, asks, uh, when building personalized search, how do we assure that the implicit user context doesn't interfere too much or too little with the intent of the search that is specified in the query? I think this goes back to the um, personalized search discussion from earlier, probably. Um, Doug, Doug, you want to take that one? <clears throat> yeah, the the how do you do it? Maybe that's that's more that's more interesting in a way because um, so if you have a lot of implicit information about the query or about the the user or the query, 
that that might actually I almost think about that instead of changing how we might interpret uh, the query itself uh, or how we might rank documents itself, it changes how our, our understanding of their intention. And, you know, if we just had the query and let's say the query is, especially if the query is a broad query, we might show a diverse set of search results. Um, and similar to what we talked about with driver before, if all of a sudden it's driver plus, I know it's Doug Turnbull, Doug is a software developer and Doug, you know, once wrote C code, blah, 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 then it might return Linux drivers or something. <clears throat> I may even know that I once read a Linux driver book, you know, hopefully not 10 years ago or something. Um, <clears throat> and I, I sort of feel like it's it's in that uh, it's in that realm of like tweaking our confidence and intentions where we make these decisions, and there are cases actually where more context, like like that driver example, might really be strongly influence the amb you know our interpretation of the ambiguity of the query, but then when we have very very specific queries where it's like Linux driver. Uh, book O'Reilly. Um, hey, it becomes really challenging to you sort of have to scope any interpretation of the intention to that to that query, and there's a lot less ambiguity. So, in some ways, personalization. How much value is there in personalization in that case? Maybe there's a little bit, but you definitely get in the spectrum of like, I might do a little bit of tie breaking with personalization. But I have a really strong understanding of what this user means, and it's almost un it's it's probably not going to be even worth trying some oddball interpretation of what that query could be. So, yeah, per personalization is almost like you're baking a cake and adding some vanilla extract. You know, you want to be very light with you know where, where you yeah what you add. If you put too much, you ruin the whole thing. Okay. Okay. I wanted to just uh, take a little diversion because I know this is a, a subject close to your hearts, which is, um, I mean, we know that Google and other large tech companies, you know, collect a huge amount of information about us, and and to make you know, it makes our lives more convenient, and it uh, has in personalization. But there's been a backlash against this, and you know, not everyone's happy with the amount of information that's collected, and the a lot of this information goes to power, um, could go to power, AI-powered search. So um, how do we address this conflict? You know, how do we build a AI-powered search and still respect privacy? Yeah, Doug, do you mind if I take that one? Yeah, go go for it. So, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard um, challenge. So um, you know, on the one hand, uh, we've got content, and you can search on content. But we've talked a lot about user signals, you know, user behaviors, what they're doing, what they're clicking on, building models based upon that, both in the aggregate and even to some degree on the personalization front um, and not doing that, not, not interpreting the user behavior significantly handicaps your ability to provide, you know, an understanding of their intent and ultimately the best search results. Um, that being said, um, most people don't like their information being collected. Um, they want it to be protected, what have you. So um, I've actually been an advisor for several years to a company called Presearch. Um, it's uh, sort of in the blockchain space. It's a, a decentralized uh, web search engine. So you know the idea um, essentially is um, you know, you've got Google and and Baidu and Bing and and those those search engines and DuckDuckGo. Uh, what we're tr ultimately trying to do is build a decentralized search platform where people can run nodes and and there's no sort of there's no centralized c control of the platform. Um, one of the key tenets, in, in my view, is if a uh, you know nobody's going to be able to go out and hire enough smart search engineers and data scientists to be to ever be able to compete with Google. Um, but what you can do is you can try to open source and democratize the ability to build out search for the world. And so I, I think of it as you know it's, it's still early phases. A lot of the technology uh, in early phases is being built still. But the idea is that eventually you have a platform where people can be rewarded and incentivized. Um, there's a whole token economy and what have you I won't get into, but it can be rewarded and incentivized for their contributions to the platform. So people who contribute code or new algorithms, the platform essentially becomes a place to test how well those perform 
and ultimately to be able to um, you know have people be rewarded for their contributions. So in uh -oh. Uh -oh. can you guys still hear us? Okay. I okay. see. I'll just keep talking. Um, okay. I can so, hear you. <laughs> so the um, so that's the idea. So I've been working with them, and, and one of the key tenets is this notion of, of privacy. And so how how do you um, how do you have a world where um, you know you can both collect user uh, information and be able to personalize search results without that information being collected by a you know a single central authority? And so one of the ways that that I'm thinking about it, and we're we're you know still working through this, is you know imagine if you went to let's just Take Google. Imagine if you went to Google, and your searches weren't logged by Google, um, but they were actually kept in your cookies, or you know somehow locally they were encrypted using your own keys, and they could be used to help personalize the search, but without you know any you know centralized party or, or other party you know having uh, access to them. So there is very much transient information, and even your IP address and all those kinds of things are restricted. So so some of those things we're actually trying to solve um, on pre-search. Um, and I'm, you know, going to be able to spend a lot more time working with them, you know, in, in the very near future. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really hard problem because I, you know, some people like DuckDuckGo, you know, they take the perspective of, hey, we're not going to log your searches and that's just how we, we work and how we operate. Um, and great, that's great for privacy, but you do handicap yourselves in terms of your ability to improve. And so I, I really am very much thinking along the lines of how do we keep the benefits of personalization while removing the risks and downsides of some company or even government having access to those things on an ongoing basis so that I do really control my data and can do, do whatever I want with it, including not collecting it at all. Yeah, I almost, uh, I almost wonder about, you know, Trey, I think you've put a lot more thought into this than I have, but I almost wonder in the spirit of like end-to-end -end encryption, is there a way that I truly can own my data where, uh, and I'm not an encryption person, we need to get an encryption person on here, but where my where the search training data going to build whatever machine learning model can somehow be turned off by me at, you know, by clicking a button and I can have some full confidence and trust that that has actually happened. Because I think as organizations, we're in a tricky position because we do need a lot of implicit information from our users. And frankly, um, as much as we want to be privacy obsessed, I think almost everyone who's not, you know, uh, uh, extremist about this is wants the convenience of things being personalized for them. So it's, you know, if I go on to some, if I go into Netflix, I, I know what it's doing. I know what it's, well, I think I know what it's doing which is part of the problem. Um, what I think, when I think there is especially where it gets really tricky is, um, I, I wonder to what extent we have an ethical obligation, even when users don't ask for it. And even when users are, con uh, are sort of convenienced by us not asking them to put front and center, like maybe, I mean, I'm not, I don't necessarily want to call out Google, but they are like the billion dollar gorilla in the room. Um, I'm, I'm almost imagining, I wish there was a checkbox under Google that was like, forget, you know, I mean, I know I can go to incognito mode and get this, but a, I know, and I know I can dig into the settings and probably do this and maybe trust that Google's going to do that, do like do the right thing, but literally a, show me everything you know about me that is going into the search, delete everything you know about me forever. Uh, or, you know, I could just turn it on and off and be able to sort of have some fine control over that. And I know that sounds annoying. And I know that like, I'm not a UI designer and I shouldn't come here search UI. So there's probably a better way to do this. But I sort of wonder if we have an ethical obligation as search teams to be thinking about that level of transparency and I feel like I, I'm saying this and everyone, you know, you might your head, you might think I'm crazy, but I sort of feel like as this these issues are evolving, I think a couple of years from now, this is going to be even more front and center and people are going to be even more aware of all the things like I just think about all the things, all the things that Google might know about me, whether it's Google Docs I've written 
um, or email or all the Google Analytics to every site I've owned or all that information, like how can I know and where is it going? And as, as much as I want us to have this, you know, uninterpretable AI, AI powered search future, I sort of think it needs to be balanced. This interpretability question also needs to be balanced by like, the, okay, what is going into the search and how can I control that? Yeah, completely agree. I mean, it, just this past week, Google was all in the news for tracking users in incognito mode. And I don't know all the details. That's probably, oh, I saw that. That's right. Yeah, uh, probably blown out of proportion. I, I haven't really dug into it, but um, I mean, even when you go into incognito mode, you know, and you go to Google, they still collect your IP address. They still collect your search terms. The only thing you're doing is not persisting your cookies. And so, you know, it's essentially up to us. And this isn't picking at Google, but you know, anybody, any search engine. Um, it's essentially, you know, you're giving them all the inform that information about yourself and your queries and you're trusting them to, you know, keep it in confidence and, you know, not do anything malicious with it. Um, but the reality is you don't have any control over that. And so I, you know, I, I do think there's, there's some um, ethical obligation on our part as people working on search to um, not take advantage of our customers and our end users and to, to respect privacy and all those kinds of things. So. Um, but the, the reality is today, it's the user information and signals are very important to delivering a good search experience. And it is way too hard to collect them in a way that is uh, easy 100%. to clean up and 100% and not going to be abused. It's just way too hard to do that. And so most companies don't have um, commercial um, uh, reasons to add those protections in and less mandated by law. Um, but I, I, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about it and trying to solve the problem, um, regardless of how hard it is. You know, maybe we can come up with some solutions that uh, make it easier for everybody. It, it, it's related to another ethical problem, I think, that AI-powered search or search in general uh, uh, faces. And I think Grant talked about this a lot in the keynote that, uh, earlier today, where we can so easily get into our own echo chambers and this is, if we think about information retrieval broad, more broadly than search, and we think about things like social media news feeds, mm -hmm. and we think about things like, uh, you know, even search results, I'm sure are, are this way, where I, I am so often, I, I was, you know, I've been, I've been waking up, I've been having trouble sleeping in uh, recently, and instead of Googling the the objective, what impact does summer have on sleep or something like that? It was, I wanted to confirm my hypothesis. I wanted someone to write that early, you know, and I, you know, this is probably true, but early morning light is definitely the cause of why I was having sleep problems or something like that. And it's a lot of people's searches are really about confirming hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And I think the sort of the personalization of, the, of search and all that sort of it reinforces that echo chamber that that we're we're all in, and especially when things. To, I think Grant said this really well. When things are very uh, session and conversion based, we lose that broader perspective of the information need of of uh, of you know. Doug just needs to be a well informed uh, sleeper or something like that, um, or Doug just needs to call his doctor. My my doctor's phone number should just pop up or something like that. Um, <clears throat> So, so our, our industry sort of faces these. And I, I, I do feel that if we're in this industry, we're all benefiting financially from having these skills. I think we need to think about and advocate for the, uh, these things to our employers. Hmm. Agreed. Really important. Yeah, really important. And, and, and also, if, if you can ask Google to delete, delete that query of yours. So that was yeah, search. Google, that thing I searched for. <laughs> Yeah. So at one point a, I had to Google that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got um, we've got another uh, question here from Daniel. Uh, we're running out of time a little bit. We're look, I should have time for this one. Um, Daniel says, uh, search is a lot about educating the user. With all this magic happening on vectors, how much how, how might search still fulfill this promise? Yeah. So. Doug mentioned earlier, uh, let's take an e-commerce example. Like when somebody comes, uh, Doug mentioned the, um, you know, walking into a department store and asking for a, you know, a sports jacket or what have you earlier. 
um, th there's lots of different kinds of intents that people have when they come to run searches, right? So sometimes there, there's more of a browse intent where somebody's just looking to see what you have available but not looking for anything in particular. Uh, sometimes um, somebody might, so, so in that case, they might type in sports jacket. Um, in other cases, they might type in uh, like a UPC or you know, product SKU or even like the specific name or ID of the product. Um, that's, that's more of an intent for them to buy, meaning they, they either buy or research. They, they know specifically what they're looking for. They don't want you to be smart and do anything. Um, you know, they don't need neural search. They literally need you to match an ID or, or a name and bring them back the one thing they're looking for. Um, you know, in, in that case, they're probably looking to purchase or they're, you know, maybe checking the price or something, but it's a very clear in, intent of, I don't need to educate them right now on other related products um, necessarily. Uh, what I need to, to do is show them this product and help them make a decision about this product. Um, and in the former case, there's a huge incentive to need to just generally educate them about, you know, the topic. Um, in the latter case, it's, it's more about trying to close the sale. Um, and there's everything in between, you know, the, the user might type in um, support or, you know, like in a, they might be looking for, like if it's an enterprise search use case, they might type in um, PTO policy or something like that. And so sometimes, and I, I would even go one step further, if, you know, say it's a telecom company, like your, your, your mobile phone company, and somebody types in pay bill. In that case, they're not looking for information at all. They're looking to actually take an action. And so that's where things like chatbots start to get integrated. And so I, I think that the the notion of a search engine as something that just like brings me back a list of ten blue links is very dated at this point. Um, mm -hmm. I, I see sort of the the idea of search giving you access to information. Sometimes you want documents. Sometimes you want to bring back um, a specific answer, maybe a snippet pulled out of a document. Sometimes you want to redirect somebody to a chat bot or to customer support. And so I think search is really becoming the, the, center, the central point or focus of how we interact with digital information. Um, and and I, I personally, I see things like search engines, recommendation engines, chat bots. Like I, I see this whole spectrum actually um, converging over the coming years as opposed to those things being separate systems. I see um, hopefully from an end user standpoint, it's a seamless experience and not, not e they're not even thinking of, of it as search. They're just thinking of it as let me find and do the things I need to do. And so, um, you know, go vector search is, is a key building block like all the other things. But I think that at the end of the day, information retrieval is about understanding the user's um, intent, delivering on their information need and information needs, I think over the last few years have just evolved to be much more than 10 blue links. They've evolved to be, help me learn, find, and act um, upon whatever it is I'm, I'm trying to do right now. And so that's that's kind of where my thoughts are. Doug? Yeah, it's really hard to like answer that question without a specific application in mind. Like um, if you were a chat bot, how you would say that you, under, you sort of understood what the user needed and built trust with them, you might ask them, Oh, is this what you mean? Do you want to cancel your airplane reservation? Something all of us may have been through recently. Um, and, or if you're a question answering system, literally like Google, Google will do this if it's, um, this is really interesting. And I think this is like a uh, uh, interesting baby step to question answering where you see the like quick answers, you get question answering, you get quick answers. Mm -hmm. And if you type a question and you like scan through the quick answers, you're like, oh, I recognize this question. This is really what I mean. That's built a link between your query and that. And so in the future, when enough people search for that and they sort of clarify that's what they mean, then we get question answering. And we will know with some confidence that, oh, this is actually the answer to the question. We've been able to measure that. Um, and Every, so every one of these sort of UI footprints is, is, is different and important. If you're in e-commerce, often it's very much about comparing, contrasting, and what are the factors that matter when you search for a television versus when you search for shoes? And can you show that in the UI? And can you know, maybe there's a little bit of personalization to know this user's gonna care a little bit more about this factor, so I'm gonna show that in the UI. Um, <clears throat> I almost think it's independent of the underlying solution 
to some extent. At the end of the day, it's sort of uh, we it's it's the intersection of sort of the product expertise, the engineering, data science, and the and the and the UX of like user asks a question and can we re reflect back to them the uh, the real understanding of what they need and sort of the information they need to take a further action. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, bring us to a close there. Um, firstly, I'd, I'd like to, to thank two of the clever, cleverest people I know working in search today, Trey Granger and Doug Turnbull, uh, for answering everybody's questions. Um, I, that, that apparently, I hear there's a rumor of some kind of book. So when that does appear, um, <laughs> you go out and buy it. Um, We're writing the AI that it will write the book. Yes, you're, yeah. <laughs> that'd be a quick route, wouldn't it? Um, I'd also like to thank everybody who posed a question. I hope we got to, uh, I think we got to almost all of them, which is great. Uh, we did have a, a list of pre-prepared questions just in case we didn't get enough uh, on the channel, but we didn't really need to dip into that much at all. So thank you very much, everyone who asked a question. Uh, we, we hoped we gave you some decent answers. Um, my apologies if I mispronounced any of your names or uh, if I missed a question in the list, but I think we got to most of them. Um, just a couple of extra other bits of housekeeping. Uh, we're still looking for your Lightning Talks. So if you look in the general channel, there's a link to the Lightning Talks sign up form. Uh, there's a couple of sessions this week, host one hosted by me, one hosted by Tita Aurora. Um, and if you would like to carry on Discussing and networking, the Gather platform is being used for the informal networking after these sessions, so do check that out. There's a link in the, in the Slack. And uh, again, thank you all very much, and we will see you all tomorrow for more exciting Berlin Buzzwords, Haystack, and Mises content. Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.